Here we go. Just another minute. Okay, so, hi, Bob. Good to see that uh, you popped in since we didn't see you last night. All right, well, uh, um, Todd advised that I wait a minute till let everybody get in, and I see 101 on the screen on my calendar, on my uh, clock at the top of the screen. So, this is, uh, oops. And I did it again. All right, back up. This is the uh, crash course on using altimeters uh, in with a focus on the three that are the most useful for NRC. But since I don't know the backgrounds of all of you folks and you can't talk to me, uh, I've posted a poll to start with to ask you, you know, what your level of experience is. So if you'd take a moment and uh, respond to the poll, which should be in the polls tab over there between the chat and the Q&A. Uh, just leave that open for a minute or two and see what uh, folks have to say about that. And I've got another one, if this works. Okay, so what I can't tell is if anybody is responding. That's interesting. So our folks, uh, our folks, uh, you're responding to the poll there. I pop back to the chat just to see. Somebody just give me an indication because uh, nothing is, was changing for me. If that doesn't work, we'll just skip it and go on. So hi, Jim. Jim, did the poll pop up? Or somebody in the chat window? I don't care who. Okay, I will, uh, uh, now I'm seeing activity. So I'm gonna leave that up for another moment and then I'm gonna end it and I'm gonna pop another one out. And hopefully that will tell me where to spend most of my time and where to what stuff I can gloss over. So I'm gonna end the first poll, which is, ranges from, I have no idea what an altimeter is to I could, to, and the last, the last choice on that, Poll is actually for Dan Wolf, because uh, he's the only one I know that could tick that bubble. All right, so we're ending that poll. All right, so the majority of you are either, I've seen them but never tried one, or I tried them from time to time, and I got, did get one response that said I can design, build, and write the software. And I'm gonna assume that's Dan unless I hear otherwise. All right, now here's an, uh, The other poll is about competition use, so I'll just leave that up for another moment or two. I don't want to burn up all my time just staring at this screen. All 
All right, I'm going to end the second poll, see if I got any responses. Ah, half of you who responded said you've never tried using altimeters in competition. All right, that sounds like the where we want to be. Sharing the screen, because mostly you're, you're going to be looking at charts since these things are so small that uh, uh, it's kind of pointless to. All right, let's get that back to there. All right, so there's kind of where, where we're going to go. We just did the polls, a little bit about who the heck am I, uh, for those of you who don't know, and a little bit about why we use electronic altimeters all very quickly, and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of what uh, Ed LaCroix really wanted me to present. So let's see if this will go forward. Come on. Great. Slideshow. Figures that now my presenting presentation software would be flaky. Okay, we did that. Two polls, introduction, living with the gadgets, Q and A. If I haven't spurned all the time. Now the good news about the Q and A is um, there's a break after this, so if we run over, we can. So to start with, who is this guy and why am I on your screens? Um, I, I, like many of you, I was a model rocketeer when I was a kid. I took a science fair uh, project all the way to the New Mexico State Science Fair when I was a seventh grader that involved launching flatworms in a rocket. Don't ask any more about that. I was at Boeing for 38 years almost. And my thing for most of that time was uh, electric powered RC from back when it was really hard. Uh, I see one question about no audio. I'm hoping that uh, that I am coming through. Uh, uh, so I did RC from back when it was hard to do, and I always liked to test stuff. Tested motors, tested speed controls, wrote, wrote articles online and in magazines about this sort of stuff. Came back to rocketry 12 years or so ago. Um, and so since I was always into measuring stuff in my electric airplanes, um, altimeters immediately caught my attention. And this was back when, uh, before a lot of the current altimeters were available, especially the small lightweight ones. I was actually flying uh, Eagle Tree uh, airspeed sensors and altitude sensors with a standalone battery and then the how highs which quest sold for a while came out anyway so i've been doing altimeters pretty much the whole time i've been back in rockets and i've collected a whole bunch of them and i did a talk at narum or at narcon in 2015 here in seattle and then uh, have since subsequently done an r d which i'll talk a little more about for narum and narum 61 and then I was also asked to write the altimeter article in the uh, current version of the, of the NAR member guidebook. And so Ed figured I should talk to, so here we go, enough of that. So why do we use, why do we have these things? Well, for those of you who've been around uh, getting altitudes for a long time, you know that it's kind of hard to do it from the ground because you've got to have tools to measure angles and record them that are set up, or if you're flying in contest situations, a couple of them with people who know how to run them. They have to be set up in the right place on the range relative to what you, how high you expect to fly and which way the wind's blowing and therefore which way the rocks are going to go. And then, the, then those four folks that are out there in the range have to be able to see the darn things. Uh, NARAM 56 taught us that gray skies are really bad for visibility for altitude events, and we wound up using black tracking powder and the folks have to talk to each other in the LCO so they know when the rockets are going up to see them and so on and so on. And then you have to do the math and write it all down. But nowadays, there's electronics keep getting smaller and keep getting smaller and uh, not only uh, computers, but sensors. And so now you can go spend 25 bucks and get this thing in, in this picture here I'm pointing to with my pointer, the perfect flight firefly. And it'll do that job, and it doesn't care what the sky looks like, and it doesn't care which way the wind is blowing, and it doesn't require any math. 
And if you spend a little more money, you can get a much tinier one. This is the Adrel or Adrel. I always been calling them Adrels. So how do these things work? Very fast, uh, and apologies to Dan Wolf or whoever it is that said I can design my own. Um, as we all, as a, it's been long known that air pressure changes with altitude and temperature in a, in a predictable way. Uh, here's just a couple of depictions of what that looks like and some of the math involved for the air regime that we operate in here on the right. Uh, so a rocket, an altimeter is what when you when you first power it up and after it's it's gotten ready to sense it's flying. I'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, it's watching for a pressure drop of a certain amount to see if it's flying, and then it starts watching for pressures to drop. And then it compares what how high it thought it was when you started with how high it thought it was when it was as high as it went. Uh, in a little computer on board using that uh, equation that was at the bottom of that uh, NASA slide uh, on the previous chart. Of course, it's really not that easy because rocket flights, model rocket flights are not smooth, predictable events all the time. Uh, and, and dealing with the challenge, with the shaking and the uh, off nominal conditions is where the real software fun comes. Uh, but these devices have got it figured out pretty well and filter out transients that give you bad results. And then you can also get a whole lot of data about the overall flight if you can get that data out of the out of the device on the rocket and into uh, a computer of some kind. So what are we going to cover? So I'm going to focus on these three devices because these are the ones that are on the current uh, approved altimeters list for competition that are small and light and therefore suitable for NRC type rockets. Uh, you can use the others, but they're bigger and heavier. And, and so that's, that's what, what does Trip call that self penalizing. Um, so we'll get into, I spent a lot of time on, on just getting the things in the rockets and getting them to work properly in there. Cause that's the one place where a lot of these uh, articles and presentations have been, they kind of say, oh, go poke a couple of holes and go put it in your rocket, go fly. And I want to spend a little more time on those aspects. And this is all based on my own flying. Uh, and what the stuff I'm going to talk about is going to depend, is also applies to sport flying. And if you're here to see about dual deployment and deployment triggering uh, altimeters, you need to go over to John Coker's talk, which started at the same time as this one did. Uh, you're in the wrong place. Uh, this is just the current state of the rules with respect to the NAR competition. I don't expect you to be able to read this on your screens unless you've got a really big one and it's nice and sharp. But this is the current altimeter requirements page from the pink book. And these, this is the current list of of uh, approved for competition altimeters. And we're going to focus on three of those. So here we go. So there's really four things you need to do to get an, alt an altimeter in your rocket and uh, have it work properly and get your results you want. First of all, it's got to be able to see the outside air pressure somehow. Uh, I alluded to this before, you, you also need to keep it from getting rattled around and uh, or lost. Uh, the, most of them have pressure sensors that are somewhat sensitive to sunlight or bright light, so you need to keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, injection gases are not nice to electronics, they're corrosive, and they also can introduce transients into into the data if the altimeter can see the ejection charge, quote, quote, see it. Uh, more on that in a bit. Okay, static ports. There's a lot of opinions about how big they should be, where they should be, uh, and so forth. Uh, the four things that have come onto the screen, uh, the, on the left here, this is the instructions from Perfect Flight that's in all of their altimeter uh, instructions, not just the one for the Firefly. The micro peak is here. Uh, this down here is the uh, words in the current version of the Adrial instructions from uh, North Coast Rocketry. And this is the summary chart from my NARAM 61 uh, R&D project. So 
So I'll get into the details of that because it's kind of a it's, it's important. So of course, since you you want to get all the credit for all the altitudes you actually flew, and since this thing's looking for the outside air pressure to drop below a certain point, or not below a certain point, but to watch you know want the lowest point it reaches. Uh, you need to be able to see that the altimeter sensor needs to be able to, to feel that outside air with with as little time lag as is practical. And so I did part of my uh, R&D last year or for NARAM 61 was I checked uh, sealed versus not unsealed compartments. And these two are the two uh, payload compartments that were stacked on top of this Nova payload over here. The one on the bottom has no vents, and the balsa block has glue smeared on it on the inside to seal the bottom. The one up here is exactly the same, except for it has three one thirty-second inch diameter holes 120 degrees apart. And so I stacked those together, taped up the joints so that the air didn't leak between the joints between the payload sections and also to the nose cone, and flew these things. Flew it six times. And I had an adrill and a and a micro peak and each compartment, so there were four altimeters aboard, and then I just compared what I saw after I flew, wrote it all down, downloaded the data, and compared. So Dan Wolf wrote a neat article about covering pretty much the same material that I'm talk, going to talk, keep talking about. In, uh, it was in the January, February 2019 sport rocketry, and this, this graph was in there, and this is a graph from one of my flights. And you can, this is the adrils that were in those two compartments. And as you can see, the green trace here uh, is the, was the one that was vented, and the red one is the one that wasn't and was sealed up. And you can see that, that, that just scrolling across here, that, that would have cost me 20 meters, roughly 20 meters of altitude score if I'd have been, if I'd have been flying an altimeter and something that couldn't communicate the air with the outside world. Uh, fairly significant. You can see the time lag too. This is the micro peaks from the same flight. And sorry, I swapped the colors uh, on the agile chart. I don't have control over the colors, and I do on this one. And I and I did it backwards. This is the one that was in the vented compartment, and this is the one that was in the in the, in the sealed one. So you can see that you got to have vent venting of some kind. There's just no no doubt about it. It doesn't have to be holes right by the altimeter in the rocket body or the payload section, but the, the air has to be able to get to it. And, and holes right there are, is the easy way to do it. And in competition models, three or four pinhole sizes, holes is all, you're, all you need. Um, other things that can work are just loose joints uh, that lets air get by. Say that it gets by the nose cone or gets by the nose block. I, I found uh, with more work on that NARAM that, that enough, uh, or that R&D project, that enough air can get through an unsealed balsa nose block that you can actually get a reasonable uh, reading that way. Ideally, this air source or sources is on our smooth, in a smooth place, and the airflow is nice when it's going by these holes and there's not bumps, especially upstream. Uh, but if all you're looking for is how high did it go and not all the rest of the flight events, and the flight is a fairly normal one where it goes most, mostly straight up and it coasts to an apogee and then it ejects and comes down, then, then uh, where the holes are are not at all critical. And so here's some examples from my own models. This is... Uh, uh, the, uh, a separate payload section in my half a or in my 13 millimeter altitude model, and there are three pinholes like the one that that arrow is pointing to in in the body, and it's also got a bare balsa nose block down here, so it's probably getting a little air in that way as well. This is a payload altitude model that's a riff on Tim Van Milligan's Midge and uses a lot of the same parts. Uh, and here, though, the altimeter is down inside the transition. And the static ports are up above here, right below the actual NAR payload. This is my E altitude model from NARAM 61. Uh, three one thirty second inch, no, three one sixteenth inch diameter holes in uh, 
in a BT50 body tube, the altimeter, though, is actually riding up inside the nose cone. This is an alpha-6 nose cone, which makes a great place to stash a little altimeter in a, in a pouch. So the, the air holes were two or three inches away and down about where the stream rode in the rocket. All that works fine. Oh, oh dear, I moved these down so they wouldn't... Uh, so my little bubble up in the upper left-hand corner wouldn't cover them up, and I somehow didn't manage to grab the arrows. So ignore where those arrows are pointing. This is an egg capsule that Apogee sells, and it also comes in the ASP extravaganza kits, which is what this model is. And there are holes poked with this big fat T-pin that actually comes in the kit uh, in, the, in here, because the altimeter lives in this, this little space below the egg. And the actual vents are way down here towards the, about two thirds of the way from where the egg capsule goes on to where the fins are. And that works fine. If I was using a, this same capsule on an egg on a stick, I'd poke the holes in the bottom of it, and then I'd have the holes in the body down somewhere around the middle of the recovery system where the airflow has a chance to smooth out. Of course, it's always easier to put these, these things in when you're build, building the rocket than later, although I retrofit them in a number by just sliding a stage coupler in and, and, and using a punch. As I mentioned before, three or four little pinholes is probably plenty for anything that we fly. I don't know about dual egg loft, maybe they need to be a little bigger. Uh, if it's not paper or, ball, or uh, paper tube, poking the holes with a pin may not work. I've got some little handheld drill bits that I've used for plastic parts. And uh, if I want to make bigger ones or put them in a bigger model, I, I actually use a sharpened brass tube, uh, 3 30 seconds or an eighth inch, uh, to poke a hole. And the pictures of all this is coming up in the next slide. And then once you've got the hole poked in, especially when you're making a bigger one, it's a good idea to, to sand the edges smooth around on the tube. So here again is the extravaganza, and there's that big honking T-pin that Andy puts in each kit for poking static ports. This is a Nova payloader, one of many that I've built, and that's one, six, one thirty-second inch hole. There's three of those uh, drilled through with a drill bit in a wooden handle. Uh, and then it's just kind of sanded gently on the outside and deburred with a knife so that it's smooth there. This is a piece of 3 seconds diameter brass tubing that's been sharpened on the inside edge with a number 11 X-Acto knife and is used as a punch into, in this case, an Alpha 6 uh, with a JT-50 stuck inside there to support the tube while you do it. So that's ways, some ways to put the static ports in. Other things you need to think about. As I mentioned before, injection... Injection uh, charges are not nice to electronics, and they can also induce spikes into your altimeter data. Um, so I like to fly them separately if I can, uh, you know, in some place where the ejection charge can't reach. But especially in sport models, and I don't know whether you've noticed, there you can see over here, I've got the Estes ready to fly uh, Saturn V, which has plastic, a little hole drilled down here. And this is the... Uh, the uh, Astrocam with punched holes, just like I was showing a moment ago in there. So it doesn't have to be a separate compartment. And as I said before, uh, bright lights, not good, especially for the micro peak, although all of them are, are susceptible to this to some degree. Uh, and uh, you know, don't let it just rattle around. It doesn't take much, they don't weigh very much, so you don't need much padding, but don't let them just rattle around. So some examples of that. So this again is the payload, uh, the riff on Tim Van Milligan's midge. And I brought the pictures back up again because you can see just by folding up the battery with the Adrel and kind of stuffing it down in the transition, uh, that, that holds it well enough. Also note that the transition is painted black on the inside. This is something that Tim put in his instructions for the midge, which is a brilliant idea because that way you can stick a micro peak down there uh, and it'll be protected from the sun and the adder will be protected from the sun while you fly. And it's less, a lot less likely to get confused by the light leaking through the translucent white plastic uh, vacuum form part. Uh, this is just some thin sheet. Uh, foam that came in some electronics. I just stashed those in a bag underneath my workbench 
and use them as needed. This is sticking and you know, wrapping a firefly up and, and putting it in that BT-50 section from the NARA, the R&D rocket. And that's a micro peak uh, wrapped in a square of estus wadding in the bottom of that egg capsule that I've shown you a couple of pictures of before. Um, you don't want to lose the thing either, and especially with payload models where you've got a heavy weight and a joint, and you've got to keep it in, and you've got a violent ejection charge, especially if you're flying uh, B payload altitude on a two-stager, and you get a killer ejection charge from that A34T that's in the second stage. It's kind of hard to keep it together, so it helps to tether the things so that they aren't get, don't get lost. It's probably going to be a DQ anyway if it comes apart and the payload section falls, but never mind that for now. Um, so, yeah, do take some steps to keep it from uh, getting away if you can. But you have to be able to get in and out, especially when you're turning it on. Uh, so that's a, those are conflicting requirements to some degree. You just have to keep that in mind. So here are some tethers. Uh, the micro peak has holes, fork holes in the in the board, and the firefly does too. Although you have to cut away uh, the clear heat shrink that's all around it in order to get to the holes, and they're quite a bit smaller. But this is just a loop of 110 pound Kevlar, uh, which can then be tied to a to, to a, a screw eye or a, or a shock cord or the the midge again has has you put a loop up through the center of the payload sector of the uh, transition just to give you something to tie your altimeter to. And this is, I wasn't tethering the adrials when I was flying them because I couldn't figure out what, I just trapped a loop between the battery connector and the, and the altimeter itself. But it turns out that you can slide a loop underneath the pins of the, of the battery connector between the base of it and the board. And that's much more secure, I think. And I, in the future, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, here's the E altitude model again. The fireflies in a little fleece pouch that my wife made for me, and, and uh, stuffed up in the nose cone in the tether that's coming off of there is tied to the uh, to the screw eye that also is the recovery anchor point. So even if it shakes apart, the, the altimeter isn't getting going to get away. Okay, well, I've burnt almost half the time. Let's see where we are. So you've got it. You've got your your air path. You figured out how you're going to protect your altimeter, uh, and you're ready to go fly. Now what? Well, oh shoot, I didn't fix this. So the first thing you got to do is power up the altimeter, uh, and if you haven't already done so with the with the Adrial, it needs to be reset, and I'll get into that in a bit later. Secure it in the model, preferably during the time when the altimeter is is not looking for pressure changes and each one has its own a firefly has it gives you 30 seconds from the time you turn it on and it reads out the last altitude until it starts looking for a pressure change to detect launch so in that 30 seconds is when you hopefully will get get it installed in your model and during that time it this little LED won't be doing anything once once it's starting to look for uh, a launch detect it'll flash about once a second Micro peak gives you 60 seconds, gives you twice as long, and it also won't tell you what this is, what's anything while this is happening. The LED will be dark, and then it'll flash about once every three seconds when it starts looking for a pressure change, and ideally it's all buttoned up in your model by then. The Adrial, you can set the value, and the default is three minutes, which I think is what the FAI contests require. Uh, its LED will actually be flashing at this point fairly rapidly twice per second uh, and then it slows down when it gets to the end of the quiet period so once you've got it in there then you know if you haven't packed your recovery system do that and go fly and then and then go find it and head for returns so how do we get the data out of these things so one at a time the firefly has an led that flashes uh, and so you, we go to returns, get get the firefly out, and it should be flashing 
when you get it out. It will either be already flashing out the altitude or it might be flashing out the maximum speed in miles per hour. The, the flashing, you can tell which part you are by watching the flashes. There's a long flash that says, I'm starting my data readout, and then, and then here comes the, the altitude data. So, and then each group of flashes is a digit in the altitude score. So here, well, let's watch it again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's 440 feet. That's what that one did last time it flew before I took that little video five years ago, six years ago. And you can be sure you're getting the altitude by turning it off and then turning it back on because that other the datum about miles per hour goes away at that point. So this is the, the hardest thing about the Firefly is that the LED isn't very bright and in bright light, you can, it's really hard to see it. But Perfect Flight has another way to do this. They have a thing called a field data display that you can plug into the little socket on the Firefly. And as I say, I, t I like to, uh, as it says on the chart, I like to turn the Firefly off because the field data display will read either with the alt altimeter on or off, doesn't matter. But if I turn it off, then I can't forget and run the battery down. So we plug it in and it'll pop up field data display and then it'll display the Apogee in feet. And there's a units button right here. You tap that and it changes it to meters. And you can also get a whole bunch of other statistics uh, out by successive button presses, including the status of the, of the little coin cell in the Firefly. Uh, the hardest part about the field data display is the perfect flight only makes them in, in batches of 10, and they don't do it very often. And so they usually they're off as soon as they show up on perfect flight direct, they're gone. Kind of like the current status with the Stratolog or CFs. The micro peak is similar. Bring it to the returns table. And again, this one in particular is fussy about sunlight, so try and keep it out of the sun. Open up your compartment where the micro peak was. In this case, it shouldn't be doing anything. It should be dark because the micro peak uh, re reports the uh, reports the altitude once right after it flies, and then it shuts itself off to save the battery. And so you probably haven't got to it by then. Uh, so it shouldn't be doing anything. So turn it off and turn it back on, and it immediately starts blinking. There's no no. Here comes the data flash at the beginning, like on the Firefly. It just starts blinking out digits. And in this case, the digits are decimeters. One, two, three, four, five. That long flash is a zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this one flew to 50.7 meters the last time it flew, before I took this little video of it. There is a way to get more data out of this. We'll cover it in a minute. And, and actually, this rapid flashing that you see at the end there, that's actually the data dump. It's really quite clever. We'll talk about that more later. OK, and again, this, this is your raw score uh, without any kind of temperature compensation done, just as with the Firefly. OK, so the, the, the ad is a little more complicated because you got to have a Windows computer, a Windows 10 computer. To, uh, to even get anything out of this one. Uh, so this, this is my little $200 Lenovo in the picture there that I bought specifically for this purpose, um, or for taking to the flying field, not just, just for Advils, but for taking to the flying field. So go find your model, grab your computer, and take both of them to returns, along with the interface device, which you also need. And then, uh, once again, take it out of the model when it's out of the sun. and uh, Hopefully, the LED on the back of it is flashing groups of three. Three flashes, pause, three flashes, pause. That means it's, it's recorded its data. If it's doing two flashes, it hasn't figured out it's landed yet, but I understand that that means it, you still have good data at that point. Either way, pull the battery, on, unplug the battery. Then plug the Adrol into the little 
data port. There's a six pin socket right there that uh, has one pin blocked off and one of the pins is clipped off of the Advil, so it only goes in there one way. Once it's in there and, uh, and it's communicating with the computer, it took the LED flashes in groups of five. It just says, I'm talking to the computer now. So then you fire up the program if you haven't already and click the read altimeter button up here at the top, uh, le upper left hand corner. And then since it's reading the temperature of the sensor, uh, you go change that to 15 degrees, 15 Celsius, and I'll tell you why about that and or explain that in a minute. And then there's also this thing called filter, which applies a little bit more uh, smoothing to the curve. And so you want to tap that too, <coughs> or click that, depending on your, if you're using a mouse. And then in this window is your raw score in meters. So here's the whole whole screens for those three. So here's the initial whole thing you'd see on the screen. This was uh, one of my virtual NARAM flights from last summer. To half a altitude. This big killer spike, by the way, is ejection charge leaking through that little balsa nose block and pressurizing the compartment before it blew it off the rocket to deploy the streamer. And so it briefly told the Adril that it went below, it went to over 30 degree, 30 meters below the ground level. Uh, fortunately, the software in this thing doesn't worry about that. It's notice it's showing 156.5, which is the top of this curve at 24 degrees C. So set it to 15, which puts you on an even footing with all the other ones that assume 15, and then hit the filter and that kind of smooths the curve out a little bit right here. And so there's the final raw final score to submit to uh, you know, the contest manager, 151 meters. So temperature compensation. All that standard model I talked about way at the beginning is uh, assumes a, a sea level air temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. And so the algorithms that are built into everybody's software assume that uh, for calculating altitude. Uh, and, and if it's not 59 degrees F or 15 C outside of the, when you're flying, then you're gonna get a reading that isn't the same as your true altitude or truer altitude. Uh, and as I say, the reason you wanna override the Adril's, uh, whatever it's got to, and set it to 15 is that way it's the same as a Firefly or a Micropeak or a Jolly Logic or a Flight Sketch or any of these others, because um, Contest Manager are, puts, applies this correction that's in this equation that's from Dan Wolf's article uh, uh, to your to your raw score to get your true altitude for the purposes of the contest, and that way it's all they're all treated the same. We went back and forth about this at NIRAM 60. There's a long sad story there about what to do about that, but this is where we wound up. Okay, so you've already seen that the Adrils can give you time versus altitude curves for the entire flight. Uh, recording altimeters in general, that's what they do. Well, the Micropeak uh, is also a recording altimeter. And one of the reasons that's a good thing is that you can set records this way. It has an interesting, and I, I alluded to this earlier, uh, the, the LED actually transmits the data to the interface optically. There's this little box on the end of a USB cable, and you put, you hook it up and start the MicroPeak app, and you turn on the MicroPeak and drop it into the hole with, the, drop the LED on the on the front side of the MicroPeak into that hole, and that's how the data gets transferred. And so this is kind of what MicroPeak data looks like. Even though we were doing optical tracking at NIRM 56, I had a micropeak in my B cluster altitude model. And this is the micropeak's view of, the, of my winning flight from NIRM 56 for B cluster altitude. And this is what you see if you click on the raw data tab up there. Statistics is a bunch of, you know, Apogee and Max G's and those kinds of things. And the configure button lets you set units and that sort of thing. Anyway, this is just a closer view of the actual graph from the micro peak from that flight.
at NARAM 56. One of the things I keep hearing about and people wonder about is, okay, so which brand is better or which one, how accurate are they? Uh, how accurate they are versus true altitude is a whole nother discussion that I'm not gonna get into. But what I have found is that they're darn consistent, brand to brand. If the software is decent, brand to brand, uh, they're, they're very, very close. And I've flown anywhere from two to nine altimeters in a model. And there were some flights from that R&D for NARAM 61 where there were nine, there were three payload compartments and there were three altimeters in each one. Uh, and in general, there's always an exception, but in general, they really agree closely And there's no one that, no brand I can say that oh, this one, uh, uh, this one always reads higher because that, that would be kind of bad for all the rest of us that we're flying with something else in a contest. Uh, Roger Wilfunk says, Ken Myers says, hi. Well, hi to Ken too. Well, well, sorry for the digression. Okay, so here's some examples. At NARAM 60, I flew a Nova payloader in classic model because I happen to like the Nova payloader a lot. Uh, and for my contest flight, well, what am I going to put in a payload model for a contest flight at, at NARAM? Well, I'm going to put altimeters in it. So there were two Adrils and a Micropeak in my classic model flight at NARAM 60 in my Nova payloader. And these are the plots of their data laid right on top of one another. I did what I had to do to uh, because of the different data formats to get them to start at the same point and the rest of that that's how it fell out i don't know why the the serial number 702 adrils data is a little noisier it was it probably was rattling around inside the payload section a little more but that that's pretty darn impressive as far as i'm concerned is how well they lined up here's another example in my sport rocketry or my uh, NAR member guidebook article, I addressed this same point and I showed four graphs of four different altimeters that were went up in a, in a Semrock Mini Hustler. And this is the figure that's actually in, in the guidebook. <clears throat> Had I found the same graphing program that I used to make the, the graph on the previous chart, Todd would have gotten this instead. There's the same data from a Flight Sketch Mini, an Altimeter 3, a Micro Peak, a Perfect Flight Peanut, and an Adrol uh, Max Out. They were all in the same uh, payload section on the same flight, laid over the top of one another. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, they at least uh, are all consistent with one another, and so I can trust what I what I read. Okay, other kind of interesting differences and things to worry about. I alluded to this before. Uh, all of them have a t most all of them have a time where you where it waits for you to put it in the model, and then it starts looking for a change to decide that it's flying. The Firefly wants to see 100 feet. And if it doesn't get to 100 feet, then it doesn't think it's ever left the ground. Uh, Altus Metrum Micro Peak is pretty similar. It's, not, it's 30 meters, so that's in the same neighborhood, just slightly less. Uh, the Max Out actually is another, this is another thing that's configurable. Uh, they call it the Setup Height Trigger and the default is 25 meters, and that's not a bad place to go, and that's where I've left all of mine when I've flown them. Uh, the instructions that come with it, or that are on the North Coast uh, site right now, suggest that you could uh, play with this, especially on a gusty day, to get uh, away from false triggers. But I can't say that I've ever had an Agile false trigger, uh, so I've never messed with this. Also, I mentioned earlier that uh, in the prep for flying, a reset. A lot of altimeters just go through their sequence, they do their quiet period, and they start looking for a new launch, 
uh, and if they and if they detect launch, then they will re, they will uh, overwrite the existing data without you having to do anything. The ad roll, on the other hand, uh, you have to tell it, okay, I want you to re, I want you to overwrite data next time you fly, and you can do it either by resetting it through the computer uh, interface directly, uh, which is the sequence. There was a the button, you may have seen it on the on the full screens where there's a reset pick, and it asks you, are you sure you want to reset it, and then it tells you, okay. Um, you can also just short a couple of pins uh, on the on the altimeter itself when it's powered, uh, and you can control whether or not you can do the second one, the shorting of pins, by this manual reset choice in the setup. If it says manual reset no, then the only way you can set it, tell it to fly again, is if with your computer. If uh, uh, if you set it to yes, and you can do it either way. I see somebody put a flight sketch uh, screen cap in the in the chat. We'll get to the flight sketches when we get done with with the contest uh, altimeters because the uh, FS Mini isn't on the list yet, and there are some reasons for that. So yeah, so if you have it set to yes, uh, manual reset yes, then you can also short those two pins together uh, when it's powered up, and it'll reset it. I've actually left mine all at no because it's going to be in the computer anyway when you read it. Wait a second, did I? Oh yes, down here on the bottom. It's important to know because there was some confusion, especially in some recent editions of the Pink Book and other places, about confirming that it's set to zero. I don't know of any rocket altimeters that you can set to zero. You can tell them I'm going to fly you again and it will overwrite the existing data. But if you then don't fly or turn it off and come back to it, the data from the last flight's still there. And that's true of all the devices I can think of. Uh, so there is no zeroing it in the sense that the data is wiped out. The prior flight's data is wiped out. When we get to altimeter three here in a bit, uh, there's a, that's an exception, kind of. Power-wise, the Firefly and the Micro Peak both run on these little tiny, uh, CR uh, 1020 or 1050 coin cells. I'm looking behind. Oh, where, oh well, had some to hold up, but I lost. It. Oh well, it doesn't matter. A little tiny coin cell, uh, and it. They, neither of them have any idea, or have no way to tell you that you need a new one, except for when they just don't work anymore. Uh, so if the LEDs starting to get dimmer than you used to, you might think about replacing it. Now with the field data display, you can get the data, get the voltage off the Firefly. Uh, what its what its cell is reading, but it, without the data display, you can't tell. So it's a little tiny coin cell. It, it takes more force than you think to get that tray out to to replace it. And don't put the tray back in without a coin cell in it, or you're really going to have trouble getting it out again. There's actually a couple of pages in the Firefly manual that explain how to do it if you foolishly do that anyway. As you've seen in the pictures, the Adrel uses a separate little 23 milliamp per hour uh, lithium polymer battery or cell, which is sold separately and is charged via the USB interface. It'll run for roughly three hours uh, on a charge, where the other two, you, you can easily turn it on one day and it'll still be running the next day if the cell's anywhere close to fresh. But it just will just stick, keep on running. It won't turn off by itself. No self-preservation there. Okay, computers, getting the data out. As you've already seen, the Adrol needs a Windows 10 machine, and that's your only choice. Uh, Altus Metrum's interface program is actually written in Java, and so it'll run on anything that will run a Java uh, installation. Uh, perfect flight for the data logger, uh, the strata logger and the peanut has a Windows app and a, a Mac OS app, and, uh, but it's only 32 bits, so current versions of the Mac OS, and it don't play nice. One of the reasons why I'm still on uh, High Sierra on this Mac that, we're, that I'm using right now. Um, and when we get to the Bluetooth here in a bit, uh, looking at the time, yike, Bluetooth here in a bit, uh, there's both iOS and Android versions of the apps. So we're done with the done with NRC. A quick word about TARC. Uh, there's three Perfect Flight devices that are are all authorized for TARC use. Uh, 
um, the Firefly we've talked about, uh, and there's this affordable precision rocket altimeter, APRA, which has been around for a while, and in my mind, the Firefly pretty much replaces it because it does all the same things except tell you what this battery voltage is. And it's way lighter and it's less expensive. Uh, so the only reason I can think of to fly an APRA in a TARC model is if you already have it. Uh, the Peanut, on the other hand, uh, saves 31 flights worth of data on board. And it's powered by this onboard lithium polymer cell, which is charged in the current version of the Peanut via USB cable. Uh, the older ones uh, came with a little separate thing that snapped onto a 9-volt battery, 9-volt radio battery. But the current ones have a USB um, micro, I think, mini or micro on the other side of the board to charge this. Uh, the thing about the Peanut and the APRA, they both have a little shorting jumper that's used as a switch. Uh, get spares and put them someplace where you can find the spares when you need them because that little bugger gets lost. And if the and if the thing takes a hit in a rough landing, uh, and the pins that it goes onto get bent, uh, bad things can happen later, especially if it gets loose. Okay, and just as an example, this is what a perfect flight uh, peanut plot looks like by itself, besides the one that was hiding in that group shot earlier. Okay, sport flying. I like sport flying with altimeters. I like to get dead light, uh, altitude data on just about everything I fly. Uh, so it's not just a competition thing for me. That's how come I've got literally hundreds of altimeter flights over the last few years. And all the models that it, I don't know, it was for the camera view, I can't tell what you can see right now, but all these models have flown with altimeters in them, including that uh, plastic Estes ready to fly center five. And for sport flying, there are some other good choices besides uh, the ones, the three we've been focusing on. Uh, and you can also get uh, accelerometer data from some of them. And some of them are, are more suited to flying without a dedicated payload section than any of the three that we've been focusing on. So here's just a quick look at a couple of choices. Uh, if you don't want to download flight curves, then and you just want to know how high they go, uh, the Jolly Logic Altimeter 1 is, is by far the best choice uh, for any model it'll fit in. And it can carry, you know, something that weighs 9 grams. Uh, and the Altimeter 2 adds a whole bunch of extra data because it's got an accelerometer in board, on board as well. Both of these you need to tell, the, both of these need to be reset before flight by holding down the button, the power button, until the word launch shows up in the screen. But, like I mentioned before, uh, if you then you don't go fly and you turn it off, the data from the last flight is still there in the altimeter 2. And altimeter 1 records 100 flights worth of data. So it's unlikely you'll ever fill that up before it gets smashed or lost. They're a little, little big. They want, the smallest tube they'll fit in is ST8. And then the, the real fun way to do it these days, especially if you want lots of data, is to have a device that talks to the computer that you've got in your pocket or on your belt already, which is your smartphone. Um, and there's two choices here. Uh, but before I bring them up, and probably everybody knows what they are anyway, um, these this is the one exception to the to the comment I made earlier about it, the last flight state is going to be there. Once you tell one of these things, either of these two devices, to start to record, then you've wiped out the data from the last flight. Uh, so, so of course, the obvious one that everybody first thinks of, and the one you can't find right now because it's being tweaked a little bit, uh, is altimeter 3. Uh, it's physically the same size as altimeter 1 and 2, uh, but it talks to your smartphone and gives you all kinds of good data between the barometric and the uh, and the accelerometer. The new kit on the block is the Flight Sketch, Flight Sketch Mini. This thing is about the same size as the Firefly. It's actually a little smaller, weighs a little less. Uh, and it runs on a slightly larger coin cell than the, than the Micro Peak and the Firefly. And it's in the same pricing ballpark as the Micro Peak and the Firefly, 30 bucks plus or minus. Um, 
I like this little thing a lot. Uh, its software is a little less elegant. Well, actually quite a bit less elegant, but that's work that's being done. And it's currently not uh, accepted for NAR competitions, and that work is being done too to get it get it on the list. Uh, and it's, I find it's really cool to be able to put one of these things in a model, turn it on, go make multiple flights and get the data out of multiple flights and not have to touch it again. So here's what the data looks like coming out of these two. So here is one of my Nova payloader flights. This was on a, a QJet last August, QJet C12. Uh, there's the uh, time versus altitude curve out of it. And this yellowish colored line here, that's the acceleration line, and you can see that looks just like the picture of a time thrust curve of a, of a QJET C12. Imagine that. That's exactly what it should look like. And there's lots of other good statistics over here that are driven by a combination of barrel and accelerometer data. And this thing will actually record two descent rates as well. So if you're flying a chute release or you just have a parachute that's reluctant to open, you'll see two different descent rates on this graph. This is the same flight from a Flight Sketch Mini. This is a screenshot of the accelerometer data from the app on my iPhone. And that's the only place you can see that data right now without downloading the raw data and plotting it for yourself. Uh, and once you reset it and download it again, this is lost as far as the display is concerned. This is a screenshot from their online on web uh, web page log uh, where you get the time versus altitude curve and a calculated time versus acceler or velocity curve that's based on the barrel data only. Uh, these are all uh, also a work in progress, uh, but it's, this is kind of cool to be able to share data with other people by just posting it to the web. So with all of that and with me over the line already, uh, well, here's some other flight sketch screenshots. This is a two-stage flight here. This is a checkmate. So A10 and A34T. And you can see the shapes of the time thrust curves just like you were reading it from a test stand almost. Okay, so what do I actually use myself? I've flown all of these. And for small models, of course, the Adrol fits in BT5 and and the others don't, so that's kind of easy. Uh, with the ex, you know the extra complication of using the Adrol, I don't find it that bad actually. Now that I've got used to it, but it is certainly more complicated than than uh, something that just flashes an LED at you that doesn't need another device. The Micropixel is half the size of the Firefly, and they have, they're like five dollars apart in price, uh, and they're both pretty easy to use. And the Micropixel are recording altimeter, so that's that's probably a good argument to spend the extra five bucks. Um, for sport flying these days, uh, depending on the model, uh, most of everything has got either Flight Sketch Mini in it or Altimeter 3 or a Firefly or some combination thereof, unless I'm testing and doing comparisons. And then the Adrols and the Micro Peaks get in the, into the game as well. Um, so just a, a quick look ahead and just to whet the competitors appetites here and then I'll flip over to the Q&A even though I'm now at the end of my time but as I say it's an hour break now so hopefully you guys can stay with me so here are the three we've been talking about on the left around the stamp and that's a flight sketch mini in the same picture so now you can really see how they look compared to each other this little guy that's a prototype flight sketch competition that the, the, and it does everything that this one does, and the only difference I can tell is the Bluetooth range isn't quite so good. But then since you need to be next to the rocket anyway to download the data, that's not a big deal. It's not like you're getting telemetry. Um, and I, as I recall, this is a 6 or 7 milliamp per hour cell, and it'll run for 3 or 4 hours on that. So these two together weigh less than the 23 milliamp per hour cell. That, Adro, that that North Coast is selling for the Adrils right now. So this is coming. Uh, this is a prototype, and so hopefully once uh, when Russ gets his software working for this to get it NAR uh, accepted for contest use, 
this one will come along for the ride because it's, it's identically, it works the same way. So that's the end of that. I am at 159, so we're officially in overtime. I'll pull up the Q&A here. Maybe stop screen sharing, I don't know. Yeah, stop screen sharing. All right, I'll pull up the Q&A. And I've learned from watching other presentations that I want to start at the bottom. Okay, so Doug Mackay says, uh, he has a flies of flight sketch. Yes, so do I. I've got hundreds of flights on flight sketch. All right, what's the downside of securing the altimeter tethered and protected by an OMAX bag with the recovery system? Well, it, it will bounce around on ejection, but otherwise it's secure from movement prior, if that's okay. Uh, generally, yes. Um, it makes, I mean, if you're thinking, especially if you're thinking competition, yeah, I, I can't see any reason not to. Uh, I've seen altimeters damaged by slamming around, uh, hanging from your recovery system harness. Um, and the data are really noisy by comparison uh, sometimes, but if, if all you're looking for is an Apogee reading, that's, that, that, sh that should be okay. Okay, and D Doug says, I've been prototyping a 3D printed case for the flight sketch. Yes, you're right. It, uh, oh, let me go ahead and uh, click that one, dismiss that question, or not dismiss it, but say it was answered. So Doug says, I've been prototyping a 3D case for the flight sketch. I presume it also needs to allow air access to, uh, or not be completely sealed. Yes, it needs to, you need to, well, look, look, I'll tell you what, Doug, look closely at your FS Mini and see those tiny little holes in the pressure sensor, which is a little square right there. And if you can have holes in your case that uh, are a little bit bigger than that, uh, you're probably fine. I, I can't imagine you can print 3D print well enough to seal a case well enough to where it wouldn't leak enough to work, but uh, yeah, you definitely need to, it would be best to, provide, to uh, make a provision. Does packing affect accuracy? I don't think so, Daniel. I don't think so, as long as you don't pack it so tight that it can't breathe at all. I can't imagine how you would do that. It was really hard to make those that sealed compartment not leak that I uh, showed early on in the presentation. Uh, and in fact, the first couple of flights before I was taping the joints between them, I was getting enough leakage to where I was getting good agreement between the open and or the vented and unvented compartments. So, so I can't imagine that you could pack it uh, tight enough to affect the accuracy much unless you put it in a Ziploc bag and then sealed where the sealed it up really, really tight and it didn't pinprick it or anything. Uh, Frank, hi Frank. Uh, note on arming: found rocket lighters, micro peak of Firefly. 100 feet in two seconds and micro peak 30 meters in five seconds. Ah, uh, that's good to know. Uh, I asked Russ Parrish at Flight Sketch if he had a time component in his uh, in his uh, launch triggering logic, and he did. And it's it's shorter than that. I think it's. Well, I I'll have to go find the email and tell what it is. Uh, 100 feet in two seconds, micro peak. 30 meters in five seconds. Of course, if you can't get to 30 meters in five seconds, that's not much of a flight. Uh, but that's good to know. Um, to that point, and since, and I'm surprised I haven't seen any questions about the Estes altimeter. The Estes altimeter, which is kind of a reverse engineered knockoff of the original, uh, original Jolly Logic altimeter one. Uh, no offense to Estes, but that's what it is, uh, has some unknown uh, short time for an altitude. We don't know how high it has to go, and we don't know how fast it has to be, but in my experience, you have to have pretty darn big static ports when you're flying an Estes altimeter to get a reliable reading out of it. If it triggers, it gets you good data, but it's a whole lot more likely to fail to detect launch than anything else I've ever flown. Let's see, Ed. Uh, how far away is Flight Sketch delivering the micro? I knew somebody would ask me how Russ was doing. I, I pinged him a week or so ago asking him more about the software tweaks so that it's uh, 
uh, will, can be acceptable to uh, for an NAR competition, the mini. Uh, and uh, like a lot of people, he's had uh, real life and COVID making his real life more complicated. Uh, and so he hasn't been able to work on it nearly at the rate he was, but he said he was catch, had caught up with most of what he was behind on and was going to turn his attention back to the software. Uh, once that gets sorted, then I expect that the, uh, the competition uh, version of the, of the flight sketch uh, will be in the pipeline. But he's also working on two other products that uh, one is a, is a deployment altimeter and one of them is also a tracker. And I'm not quite certain what his priority is once he gets the software sorted to where Dan is happy with it. Dan and I are happy with it because I'm not happy with it at the moment either so for some details. It's not very good at filtering spikes right now. And so it, uh, it you have to look at the graph to get good data. Um, let's see. So does that help? Does that kind of give you a sense it's coming, but I don't have a time. And I'm sorry that uh, I don't have a time because I really wish I could have announced something here for uh, Russ. Bob, uh, let's see. Now, yeah, Bob Zurich says he and Becky have now feed a lanyard loop through the battery wires, uh, through the connector legs on the board, and then put the battery through the end of the loop and then tighten. I think that's kind of the picture that I saw illustrated on the North Coast uh, site. Uh, I've never had any issues with it disconnecting in flight, but I can see where if it was somehow got outside the body of the rocket and was hanging by a lanyard and the battery was was not also tethered, that that could be an issue. Thanks for the thought. Ed Pearson. Thoughts on using an altimeter to time flights again instead of timers. You know, I've noticed that those that can tell you what the flight time is uh, give you reasonable values, but I've never actually uh, attempted to compare what, say, an altimeter three says the flight duration is uh, versus what I get if I did it with a stopwatch. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, clearly, if you're thinking about the timing requirements in TARC, for example, uh, you would have to make sure that uh, everybody used the same method. Either everybody uses stopwatches like they do now, or everybody list, let the peanut tell you how long it flew. The Adrill and the, and the, and the uh, Firefly couldn't tell you anyway. Well, you're welcome, Ed. So I can, I'm, I, we've got 207, so we're seven minutes into the break. Uh, I'm certainly uh, willing to get a little more horse if somebody wants me to do so. So I've got still got the Q&A tab open. I can look over at the chat and see if there's anything I should. Oh, there's Russ. Okay, Russ Parrish. Okay, here's an answer from Russ Parrish at Flight Sketch in the chat. New boards are in fab now with my feedback. I'll send you an email. So I, uh, this is about the competition version, I, I presume. So that's good to know. Yeah, I, I, my only comment to him was, or my main comment to him was, there's no way to tether the darn little thing. Uh, and it's also the board, the, the current one, the board is extremely thin. And I just have this vision of it banging into something and getting broken in half. Uh, so I don't know which tweaks Russ is referring to over there, but uh, uh, clearly he's working on the competition one as well. This is, it's there in the chat. Thanks for, for telling us, Russ. Back to Q&A. Okay, that's just Ed's comment. So I'll stay over here in the chat. Uh, learn the hard way. You have to be signed in your flight sketch account to save the files. Uh, Doug Mackey says that you have to be signed in your flight sketch account to save the files. You can save them locally on your phone. Um, if you've got an iPhone or an iPad, uh, it, you'll find it. It'll find a flight sketch folder via your Files app, and you'll have the raw data anyway. The same thing that you'd be uploading to the to the website. I've had terrible luck with Android. It's like hit or, about every third or fourth time I say save, it actually does. Uh, 
with the little testing that I've done on an Android, uh, Lenovo, little Lenovo 8-inch Android tablet. Uh, so your mileage may vary significantly with respect to Android. But if you hit the Save Locally button, and I, in my general, uh, the way I generally do that when I fly a flight sketch these days, I, uh, I screenshot the accelerometer data and save it to my photos. Then I save, then I edit the file name and, the, and put the you know, flight number, model number, so-and-so, flight number, so-and-so so in, the, in the title field, and maybe note the motor in the uh, comments field, save it locally, and then upload it. And then if the upload fails, because I'm not logged in, I've still got the data, and at that point I, uh, sometimes I, uh, at that point I'll go log in, and, and then you have to down, and then uh, go through the whole process again. But and that also, the saving locally also means you can save the data and upload it later if you're flying at a place where you don't have your cellular carrier doesn't uh, doesn't talk to it. I've been there's one place I've flown in the last year uh, that doesn't have cell coverage for AT and T. And fortunately, Russ added that ability to the Flight Sketch app just before I went over there last spring. And I see Russ has responded to my comments about the thicker board and the whole. And also, oh, that's right, the battery voltage, because right now what it reads out is is something else when you, on the app. So let's see. Then, oh, there's two more popped over in the Q&A. Okay, let's see what we got. Bob Zurich, one other comment. Dan and I have discussed is Altus Metrum does not do a good, as good a job filtering air ejection charge really close to and before Apogee, even though the altitude is the same as the ejection spike is far enough away from the Apogee. Yeah, that's, that's as I kind of alluded to, way up at the beginning, handling the transients is where the black art and where this hard software is. And that's where you see the differences uh, between the makers. Uh, the math for the, and the pressures, and I've even done a little bit of overlaying pressure data, raw pressure data out, uh, just to see how they compare. Uh, when, the, when the FS Mini first came out, I flew it against Altimeter 3 a lot and did a lot of data comparisons. And uh, yeah, software is the hard part. And they all have to, although the, yeah, Keith's software is open sourced for the MicroPeak, but in general, that's, that's hard work for people. Let's see, same as other altimeters, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely differences. When I've overlaid the data and zoom in on the apogees, you can see those little characteristics. Fortunately, most of the time, uh, it doesn't make a big difference. Let's see. Russ, I figured you would uh, sneak in and listen in, since you knew I was going to talk about your stuff at the end. Yeah, those of you who are competitors, please give Russ some encouragement to work on the comp. Because there's people on the forums that want him to get the deployment altimeter out. Okay, back over to Q&A. Oh, I didn't clear those out. All right, so we're, 15, we're 13 minutes past time. Uh, looks like the Oh, thank you, Russ. I appreciate that. Okay, going once on Q&A or chat questions or comments. Going twice. All right, I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs>